Hi, and welcome to another story. And today we have part one of The Illustrated Mum by Jacqueline Wilson, starting from the very beginning. Cross. Marigold started going weird again on her birthday. Star remembered that birthdays were often bad times, so we tried really hard. Star made her a beautiful big card cut into the shape of a marigold. She used up all the ink in the orange felt tip colouring it in. And then she did two sparkly silver threes with her special glitter pen and added happy birthday in her best italic writing. They do calligraphy in year eight and she's very good at it. I'm still in the juniors and I'm useless at any kind of writing so I just drew on my card. As it was Marigold's 33rd birthday, I decided I'd draw her 33 most favourite things. I drew Mickey. I'd never seen him but Marigold had described him enough times and Star and me. And then I drew the Rainbow Tattoo Studio and the Victoria Arms and the Nightbirds Club. I did them in the middle all clumped together and then round the edges I drew London and the seaside and the stars at night. My piece of paper was getting seriously crowded by this time but I managed to cram in a CD player with, a lots, with lots of Emerald City CDs and some high heels and a bikini and jeans and different coloured tight tops and lots of rings and bangles and earrings. I was getting a bit stuck for ideas by this time and I'd rubbed out so often that the page was getting furry so I gave up and coloured it in. I wanted to do a pattern of marigolds as a border, but Star had used up the orange already, so I turned the marigolds into roses and coloured them crimson. Red roses signify love. Marigold was very into symbols, so I hoped she'd understand. Then on the back I did a great garland of red roses to signify a whole bunch of love and signed my name. We gave her presents too. Star found a remixed version of Emerald City's Greatest Hits for only £2 at the Saturday morning market. I bought her a sparkly hair clasp, green to match her eyes. We even bought a special sheet of green tissue paper and a green satin ribbon to wrap up the presents. Do you think she'll like them? I asked Star. You bet, said Star. She took the hair clasp and opened it up so its plastic claws looked like teeth. I am a great present, she made it say, and then it bit the tip of my nose. Marigold gave us both big hugs and said we were darlings, but her great green eyes filled with tears. So why are you crying? I said. She's crying because she's happy, said Star. Aren't you, Marigold? Hmm, said Marigold. She sniffed hard and wiped her eyes with the back of her hand. She was shaking, but she managed a smile. There, I've stopped crying now. Doll, okay? It wasn't okay. She cried on and off all day. She cried when she listened to the Emerald City CD because she said it reminded her of old times. She cried when I combed her hair out specially and twisted it up into a chic plate with her new green clasp. God, look at my neck. It's getting all wrinkly, she said. She touched the taut white skin worriedly while we did our best to reassure her. I look so old. You're not old at all. You're young, said Star. Thirty-three, Marigold said gloomily. I wish you hadn't written that right slap bang in the middle of your card, darling. I can't believe thirty-three. That was the age Jesus was and he died. Did you know that? Marigold knew lots about the Bible because she was once in church home. Thirty-three, she kept murmuring. He tried so hard too. He liked kids. He liked bad women. He stuck up for all the alternative people. He'd have been so cool. And what did they do? They stuck him on a cross and tortured him to death. Marigold, Star said sharply, look at Doll's card. Oh yes, darling, it's lovely, Marigold said. She blinked at it. What's it meant to be? Oh, it's stupid. It's all a mess, I said. It's all the things you like most, said Star. That's beautiful, said Marigold, looking and looking at it. And then she started crying again. Marigold, I'm sorry, it's just it makes me feel so awful. Look at the pub and the high heels and the sexy tops. These aren't mumsy things. Doll should have drawn, I don't know, a kitten and a pretty frock and Marks and Spencers. That's what mums like. It's not what you like and you're my mum, I said. Doll spent ages making you that card, said Star. She was starting to get red in the face. I know, I know, it's lovely. I said, I I'm the hopeless case. Don't you get what I'm saying? Marigold sniffed again. Anyway, let's have breakfast. Hey, can I have my cake now? Birthday cake for breakfast. Great idea, eh, girls? We stared at her. We didn't get you a cake, said Star. You know we didn't. We asked and you said a cake was the very last thing you wanted, remember? No, said Marigold, looking blank. She'd gone on and on that we mustn't get her a cake because she was sure she was starting to put on weight and the icing would only give her toothache. And anyway, she didn't even like birthday cake. I love birthday cake, said Marigold. I always have a special birthday cake. You know how much it means to me because I never had my own special birthday cake when I was a kid. Or a proper party. I hate it that you girls don't want proper parties and you just go to stupid places like Laser Quest and McDonald's. They're not stupid, I said. Star got asked to lots of stuff, but I'd never been to a McDonald's party and no one had ever asked me to a Laser Quest either. 
I hoped I'd maybe make a lot of friends when I went to the high school. I wasn't in with a party crowd in my class. Not that I wanted to go to any of their parties. I wouldn't have been friends with any, any of that lot if you'd paid me. Except maybe Tasha. OK, OK, I'll go and get you a birthday cake, said Star. Marks and Sparks open early on a Saturday. You wait. She took the housekeeping purse and rushed out, slamming the door. She's cross with me, said Marigold. No, she's not. She's going to get your cake, I said. Cross, 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 Marigold muttered, frowning. That's what they used to say in the home. I'm very cross with you, Marigold. This old bat would bring her face right up close to me so that her eyes got so near they crossed too. Cross, 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 she'd say, and her spit would spray on my face. She was so mean, that one. She never hit us. She knew she wasn't allowed, but you could tell she really, really wanted to. She just said, stuff, cross, cross, cross. Marigold. I didn't know what else to say. I always got a bit scared when she talked like that, muttering fast, playing around with words. I wish Star would hurry back. Just words. Cross words. I giggled in case Marigold meant it to be a joke. She looked startled. We have crosswords at school, I said quickly. I can't do them. I'm hopeless at spelling and stuff like that. Me too, said Marigold. I hated school. I was always in trouble. Yep, same here, I said, hoping that Marigold was better now. I was starving hungry. I took a handful of dry cornflakes to keep me going. Marigold helped herself too. Yet yeah, Star's clever, I said, and she's got even cleverer since she went to the high school. A real old brainy box. Well, she obviously takes after her father, said Marigold. Mickey was the cleverest guy I ever met. So creative and artistic and yet sharp too. You could never fool him. I wish he was my dad too, I said. Marigold patted me sympathetically. Never mind. I've got you for my mum. I said it to make her happy, but it started her off crying again. What kind of a useless, stupid mum am I? She said. You're the best ever, mum. Please don't cry again. You'll make your eyes go all red. Red eyes, ropey neck, maudlin mood. What a mess. What have I got to show for my 33 years, eh? Apart from you two lovely girls. What would Mickey make of me if he came back right now? He always said I had such potential, and yet I haven't done anything. You do lots and lots of things. You paint, and you make beautiful clothes, and you dance, and you work at the studio, and... And if I don't do something with my life soon, I never will. I'm getting old so quickly. If only Mickey would come back. I was a different person when I was with him. He made me feel so... She waved her thin arms in the air, her bangles jangling. Can't find the words. Come here, doll. She pulled me close for a cuddle. I nestled against her, breathing in her magical musky smell. Her silky red hair tickled me. I stroked it, letting it fan out through my fingers. Your roots need doing soon. And you've got a few split ends. I'll snip them off for you, if you like. You're still going to be a hairdresser, doll. You bet, I said, turning my fingers into scissors and pretending to chop. I remember when you cut all the hair off your Barbie doll, said Marigold. And stars, too. She was so mad at me. You girls, I wish I'd had a sister. Well, you like a big sister. I feel like I'm at a crossroads in my life, doll. Cross. Hey, you know what? How about if I got a cross for a tattoo? You haven't got much space left, I said, rubbing her decorated arms. Marigold was examining herself, peering this way and that. How about right here, across my elbow? Brilliant. The cross could go up and down my arm. I need a bit of paper. She used the back of a My Birthday card, but I didn't really mind. She sketched rapidly, her teeth nipping her lower lip as she concentrated. I peered over her shoulder. You're so good at drawing, I said wistfully. Her hand was still shaking, but the pen line was smooth and flowing as she drew an elegant long Celtic cross with roses and ivy twining around it. Roses, she said, looking up at me, like the ones on your card, doll. I felt immensely proud, but also worried. I knew what Star was going to say. It's a lovely picture, I said. Couldn't you just keep it a picture on paper? We could get a special frame for it, and you could hang it over your bed. I want it to be a picture on me, said Marigold, her eyes glittering green. I wonder if Steve's got my early appointments. Uh, I can't wait. I'll get him to trace it and do it now. Special birthday present. She leapt up. Come on. But Star's getting your birthday cake. Oh, she screwed up her face in disappointment. Oh, yes. Well, come on, Star. Where has she got to? Why did she have to go out now to get this cake? This was so unfair of Marigold. I couldn't look her in the eyes. She was terrible when she twisted everything about. She always did it when she got worked up. I knew I should tell her she wasn't being fair to Star, but I couldn't make myself. It was so special being Marigold and me. Star was at ages. Marigold paced the flat in her high heels, groaning theatrically and watching the clock. When Star came back at last, carefully carrying a plastic bag on upturned hands, Marigold had to make an extreme effort. Star, you've been such a long time, sweetie. Sorry, there were heaps of people, and I had to walk back carefully because I didn't want the cake to get bashed. 
I do hope you like it. I didn't know whether to pick the fruit or the sponge. I got the sponge because it was cheaper, but maybe you like fruit more. Whichever, said Marigold carelessly. Come on then, let's have a slice of cake. She was already pulling it out of the box, barely looking at it. She didn't even put it on a proper plate. She rummaged in the drawer for a sharp knife and went to cut the first slice. You've got to make a wish, said Star. Marigold raised her eyebrows but closed her eyes and wished. We didn't need to ask what she was wishing for. I saw her lips say the word Mickey and then she was hacking away at the cake and gulping her slice so quickly she sprayed crumbs everywhere. What's the big hurry, said Star. I stopped eating my own slice of cake. I'm going to try to catch Steve early before my cl any other clients. I've just designed the most amazing symbolic tattoo, said Marigold. No, said Star. Not another. You promised. But this is so beautiful, darling. A cross because I'm at the crossroads. Look. Marigold waved her design. You've spoilt Doll's birthday card, said, da st said Star. No, she hasn't, I said quickly. You said it was sick and pathetic getting yourself tattooed again and again. You said you'd save up for laser treatment to get them removed. You said, Star said, her voice rising. I said a whole load of stuff just to keep you happy, darling. But I love all my tattoos. They're all so special to me. They make me feel special. They make you look like a circus freak, said Star. There was a sudden silence. We stood looking at each other in shock and embarrassment, hardly able to believe what Star had just said. Even Star seemed astonished. Okay, so I'm a freak, said Marigold shakily. I don't care. I don't have to conform to your narrow view of society, Star. I've always lived my life on the outside edge. Now you're sounding like some corny old film. Why can't you act normal? I don't want to be normal, said Marigold. I can't figure out why you do all of a sudden. What's the matter with you, Star? Maybe I'm growing up. When are you going to grow up, Marigold? She seized her slice of cake and crumpled it into tiny crumbs, and then she brushed her hands and ran into our bedroom. Marigold and I looked at each other. Marigold tried to look like she didn't care. She put her hand to her head as if she was trying to hold it together. What should I do? She whispered to me. Star didn't really mean it, I said. She was just upset because she thought you didn't like the cake. I know she's got this thing about tattoos, but I want the cross, doll. I shrugged helplessly. Star was always the one who told Marigold what to do. I wasn't any good at it. It will look incredible. I just know it, said Marigold. I have to go now or Steve won't have time. Will you come too? I hesitated. I wasn't like Star, who had refused to set foot in the Rainbow Tattoo Studio. I found it fascinating, though I was sometimes a bit scared of some of the customers. Steve himself was kind of scary too, with his shiny bald head and his long beard and his pointed tongue with a stud through the end. I hated seeing it flash silver in his mouth. He knew this and stuck his tongue out at me whenever he saw me. Please, Marigold pressed, I'll need you. It'll hurt. You said it doesn't hurt much at all. It will hurt on the elbow. It's always painful on a joint. Then why? It'll be more special if I have to suffer for it, said Marigold. That's silly, I said. I'll need you there so I can hold your hand to be brave, said Marigold. If you don't come, I might go really mad and get Steve to do the cross on my face, up the forehead, down the nose, across both cheeks. She shook her head at me. Oh, doll, I am joking. I wasn't sure. When Marigold was in this sort of mood, she could do the craziest thing on a sudden whim. Maybe she really did need me to go with her. I was worried, but I also felt very grown up and special. It was me she needed, not Star. I still felt bad about Star, though. Come on, doll, said Marigold, desperate to be off. Wait a second, I said, and went to our bedroom. I hesitated and hesitated and then knocked on the door in case Star was crying and didn't want me to see. She didn't answer. I timidly peeked around the door. She was sitting on the end of the bed, her fists clenched in her lap. Her face was hidden by her long hair. Star? Star, she wants me to go with her. Star shrugged, as if it was nothing to do with her. Maybe Steve will have an early customer, I said. Then he won't be able to do it. Or maybe she'll change her mind again. You know what she's like. I know what she's like, Star said slowly. Her teeth were clenched too. Star? Star, stop bleating my name like that. It's so irritating. Do you mind if I go with her? I'd better, hadn't I? You do what you want. Can't you come too? Star looked at me witheringly. I'm not going near that stupid place. I waited, trying to think of some way to make everything better. It's a great birthday cake, Star. I wasn't getting anywhere. I suddenly heard the front door bang. I had to leave Star. I ran hard after Marigold. She was halfway down the stairs. Wait for me. I thought you maybe weren't coming, said Marigold. She laughed. But you are. You are. You are. She caught hold of me on the first floor landing and swung me round. What a racket! Mrs Luft was down at the front door, sorting through the post. 
She seemed to be addressing an invisible audience. Do they have to be so noisy on the stairs, up and down, late at night, first thing in the morning? Some people have no consideration. Any post for me? Marigold asked. She always got extra hopeful on her birthdays and Christmas, just in case Mickey decided to get in touch. Ever since we'd been given the housing trust flat, she'd renewed the postal forwarding service every three months. It was the one thing she never forgot. Electricity bill, said Mrs Luft, handing it over. Well, I don't think I'll bother with that, said Marigold, tossing the unopened bill into an old table in the hallway. I looked at it anxiously. Mrs Luft sniffed. That's very responsible. <laughs> what an attitude, I must say, she announced. Some people take a pride in paying their bills on time. Others are downright feckless. Spend, 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 and lets the state a fork out for her and her children. Marigold told Mrs Luft to go away and mind her own business. She didn't say it politely. She used short, sharp words. Yes, that's just the sort of language I'd expect from her, said Mrs Luft. She shuffled into her flat, her backless slippers slapping the door and the floor at each step. Mad old bat, said Marigold, taking my hand. Come on, let's see if we can run all the way. She was faster than me at running, even though she was wearing high heels. I hung back and had to stop and gasp for breath at every new street, a stitch in my side. It was still hurting when we got to the Rainbow Tattoo Studio. The clothes sign was on the door, but when Marigold tapped the opaque glass with her long fingertips, Steve came to the door. Oh, oh, he said, giving her one glance. I'm not starting any long customised job now, Goldie. I've got a guy coming in at ten. Oh, Steve, be a honey. Which guy? If he's a biker, he won't make it till eleven at the earliest. And if it's a first-timer, then it's odds on he won't even turn up. Please, sweetheart, it's my birthday and it's just this gorgeous design. You'll love it. Look. She waved my card at him. Bit intricate, isn't it? He said, looking at my birthday drawing. I blushed, not wanting him to laugh at me. Steve, said Marigold impatiently. Nice drawing, Steve said to me. And then he turned the card over. Ah, it's great, isn't it? I thought right here. Marigold tapped her right elbow. Steve tutted, the silver flashing in his tongue. You're paying, I take it. Out my wages, said Marigold. But we only need you here the odd day or so when someone needs a custom job. I'll come in and do flash work, whatever. I don't trust you to do flash work properly, Goldie. Remember that guy who wanted the samurai arm piece and you did the mouth all smiley instead of sneering? Marigold was smiling herself. She bent over to Steve and put her arms around his neck, whispering in his ear. I turned my back on her and looked at the wall of flash. They had all the usual designs on display, most of them pretty boring stuff, dragons and tigers and skulls and basic Celtic designs. I could understand why Marigold got so sick of tracing out the same designs again and again. No wonder she sometimes gave the dragon flame breath, or a tiger a little cub, or placed a perky little wig on top of the skull. She was still, wow she still, she was still wound round Steve. He soon weakened. Okay, okay, I'll do your cross. Only no shrieking the place down. I don't want you frightening away any potential customers. I won't even whimper, she promised. Steve tinkered with his needle bar, bunching them at various angles. You're a genius, Steve, Marigold said, tracing her cross design into duplicating paper. No one can ink like you. Flattering witch, he said, wiping her arm with alcohol and then spraying it with soap and water. He carefully stuck the duplicating paper down, rubbed it all over, and then left the picture in place. You're sure, Goldie? Surer than sure, she said, taking my hand with her free right arm. Steve rubbed Vaseline over the design, poured out a cap full of colour, put on his rubber gloves and started the machine. I couldn't look for a long time. I held Marigold's hand tight as tight while her nails dug a deep groove in my palm. Her eyes were watering and she bit hard on her bottom lip, but she was as good as her word, not making a whimper. The machine buzzed loudly. Steve whistled tunelessly through his teeth, his way of concentrating. He stopped every now and then and sprayed Marigold's arm and dabbed it dry. I dared look. I saw the black line of the cross taking shape. It took well over an hour before it was finished. Two customers were kept waiting, but Steve let them see what he was doing, and they watched fascinated. Right, done, Steve said at last. Marigold got up very slowly, straightening her arm with extreme caution. The front of her shirt was damp with sweat. Her face was chalk white, but when she saw the new cross tattoo in the mirror, it flooded pink. Oh, Stevie, it's going to look wonderful. It's your design, babe, said Steve, coating it with special ointment. He went to wrap it in a bandage, but Marigold stepped aside. Let me take... Well, let me look a minute more. Marigold craned round to examine every detail. That's a truly cru cool tattoo, said one of the customers. I reckon it would look great on my lady. Will you do a cross on her exactly like that? I'll design her own personal cross, if that's what she'd like, said Marigold. But this one's mine. She let Steve put the bandage on and then grinned at me. 
This one's mine too, she said, ruffling my hair. Come on, doll. See you. See you, Steve. Steve. See you, Steve, darling. He was busy breaking the used needles off the bar and putting the equipment in the steriliser. Don't forget this, he said, pointing to my card. I don't need the design. It's permanent now, said Marigold, tossing it in the bin. It's on the back of your birthday card, Steve reminded her. Whoops, said Marigold, retrieving the card. Sorry, doll. It's okay, I muttered. Hey, you're not going to go all sulky on me too, are you? It's my birthday. We're going to have fun, said Marigold. It didn't really work. Star was barely speaking when we got back. When she saw Marigold's bandage, she screwed up her face in disgust. We had the rest of the birthday cake for lunch. Marigold bought wine for herself and juice for Star and me. So, we can all drink to the birthday girl, she said. She drank her wine in less than half an hour and then said she felt a little sleepy. She curled up on the sofa, her arm carefully out to one side. She fell asleep in the middle of a sentence. Star stared at her. She only drank so much because her arm hurts, I said. So, whose fault is that, said Star. But with Marigold out of it, Star was much better company. She'd done all her boring old weekend homework, so now she was free to play with me. I wish we could watch television, I said. The rental firm had taken our television and video recorder away last week because Marigold hadn't kept up the payments. She promised she'd see about getting us a new set, but she hadn't done anything about it yet. Will you play, television star? I begged. Oh, honestly, doll, you and your dopey games, she groaned. Please, just for ten minutes then. We went into our bedroom, shutting the door on the sleeping Marigold. Star wouldn't try properly at first and said she felt stupid, but eventually she got into it too. I said we'd do Top of the Pops first because I knew Star liked being all the different singers. And then we did this children's hospital programme and I was a little girl dying tragically of cancer and Star was my nurse giving me treatment. Then we played vets and Star's old teddy and my china dog and the troll doll. We'd won at a fair with the pets in distress. Star started to get bored with this, so I said we'd do some soaps because she's great at accents. So for a while we played Neighbours and then swapped to EastEnders and then Star herself suggested we do Friends. We both wanted to be Rachel and then we got onto hairstyles and we stopped the television game and played hairdressers instead. Star played for ten times ten minutes and it was great. We almost forgot Marigold. She woke up in a snappy mood, going on about the cross again, muttering to herself, holding her bandaged arm. She spent ages in the bedroom after tea. Are you all right, Marigold? I called eventually, standing outside the door. I'm fine, 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 never finer, said Marigold. She came out all dressed up in her shortest skirts and high highest heels, her black chenille sweater, hiding her bandage. You're going out, Star said flatly. Of course I'm going out, darling. I've got to celebrate my birthday, said Marigold. Star sighed heavily. Don't be like that. I'm just nipping down to the Vic. I'll be back in a couple of hours, promise. We both looked at her. I promise, she said again. She stroked her bulky arm gingerly. I'm at the crossroads. I'm going to take the right turning now. You'll see. I'll be back by ten. Half ten at the latest. We stayed up till midnight and then we gave up and went to bed. Marigold. I woke up too early. It wasn't properly light yet. My heart started fudding. I scrabbled around for my silk scarf. I always like to take it to bed with me. Star calls it my cuddle blanket. When she's being really mean to me, she can t sometimes hides it. I could only re feel rumpled pet sheet and lumpy pillow. I wriggled up the bed a bit and then realised I was lying on my scarf. I rubbed it quick against my nose, snuffling its sweet, powdery smell. I still felt frightened, and then I remembered. Star! I leant out of my bed and reached for her. Star, wake up, it's morning. Nearly. Do you think Marigold's come, up, come home? Come back. Go and look. Star mumbled from under her covers. I was scared to look. Scared in case she was in a state. Scared in case she had someone with her. Scared in case she hadn't come back at all. You look, Star, I begged. You're the eldest. I'm sick of being the eldest. I'm sick of being the one who has to try hardest all the time. I'm sick, sick, sick of it, said Star. Her voice was thick. I thought she might be crying. OK, I'll look, I said, and I got out of bed. My heart was like a little fist inside my chest, punching and punching. Don't be so stupid, I whispered in Star's voice. She'll be back. She'll be in bed fast asleep. Just go and take one peep. I crept across our room, over the landing. I stood in front of Marigold's open door. Had it been open or shut last night? I couldn't remember. I could see the edge of her bed, but no mound under the cover. No foot poking out, palely from beneath the sheet. She'll be curled up in a ball, legs tucked up. That's why you can't see her. She always sleeps like that. Go and look, I whispered. I stood still for more than a minute, and then I whispered her name. Nothing. I stepped into her room. It was empty. 
I knew it was empty, with one glance, but I pulled the covers back. I lifted the pillow, as if she might be curled so small she could be hiding underneath. I looked under the bed and felt for her there with my hands. I rolled little dust balls in my fingertips, breathing very quickly, wondering what on earth to do next. I looked in the bathroom in Lou. I went into the kitchen to see if she could be there, conjuring up a crazy image of Marigold making toast, hours early for breakfast. The kitchen was empty. The tap dripped. Plink, plink, plink. None of us knew how to change the washer. I stood watching it, blinking in time until my eyes blurred. I went back to Star. She was still under the covers, but I could tell by her breathing that she was wide awake and listening. She's not back. Star sat up. I heard her swallow. I could almost hear the buzz of her thoughts. Look in the loo, she said. I have. She's not anywhere. What's the time? It's half past five. Oh, Star sounded frightened too now. Well, maybe, maybe she's not planning on getting back till breakfast. Star, what if, what if she doesn't come back? She will. But what if something bad has happened to her? She's the one who does bad things, said Star. She reached out and caught hold of me by the wrist. Come on, she'll be all right. She's probably met some guy and she's with him. But she wouldn't stay out all night long, I said, scrabbling into her bed beside her. Well, she has, hasn't she? Hey, you're freezing. Sorry, never mind, here. Star pressed her warm tummy against my back and made a lap for me with her legs. Her arms went around me tight and hugged me. Oh, Star, I said, crying. Shh, don't get my pillow all wet and snotty. She is all right, isn't she? She's all wrong, 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 but she'll be back any minute now, you'll see. We'll go back to sleep and then we'll wake up and the first one we'll hear is Marigold singing one of her stupid songs, right? Yes, right. I do like it when you're being nice to me. Well, it's no fun being nasty to you. It's like kicking Bambi. Let's try to sleep now. I love Bambi. I tried to think of all the best bits in Bambi. I thought of Bambi frolicking with flower, with all the birds twittering and Thumper singing away, tapping his paw. Then my brain flipped to fast forward. What? said Star, feeling me stiffen. Bambi's mother gets killed. Oh, doll, shut up and go to sleep. I couldn't sleep. Star couldn't either, though she pretended at first. We turned every ten minutes, fitting around each other like spoons. I tried counting to a hundred, telling myself that Marigold would be back by then. Two hundred. Three hundred. I wanted my silk scarf, but I'd left it in my bed. I put the end of the sheet over my nose instead and fingered the raised edge of the hem. It started to get lighter. I shut my eyes, but in the dark, inside my head, there was a little television showing me all the things that might have happened to Marigold. It was so scary I poked the corner of the sheet in my eye. It hurt a lot, but the television set didn't even flicker. I tried to hum, so that I couldn't hear it. I banged my head on the pillow to see if I could switch it off. That way. What on earth are you doing, said Star, just trying to get comfy. You're going about it in a funny way. It's to stop myself thinking stuff. It's so scary. Look. Let's tell each other really, really scary stories. We'll think about that, right? There was this video I saw at that sleepover I went to. And uh, there were these girls in a house. And they played these real witchy tricks on another girl. So that when she got out of bed, she stepped into this great squirmy mass of spiders and slugs and snakes. And she screamed and started running. And all those other snakes dropped on her head and writhed around her neck and down inside her clothes. Shut up, shut up, I said, shrieking. And yet it helped. We were suddenly just us playing a scary game, and it was almost fun. I had never seen any horror videos, but I was quite good at making them up. Star told me this story about a dead man who comes back to kill all these kids, and his fingers are like long knives so he can rip people in half. I've got a better ghost, a real one, Mr Rowling, I said triumphantly. Mr Rowling was the old man who lived upstairs. He had this illness when we first moved in here, and he knew he was dying, and he said he was going to leave his body to medical science. I'd had to ask Star what that meant, and when she told me it had given me nightmares, thinking of medical students cutting up all these little bits of Mr Rowling. Mr Rowling couldn't be scary. He was quite a nice old man, said Star. Yes, he might have been nice when he was alive, but he's really, really scary now because those medical people cut out his eyes so he's just got horrible bleeding sockets, and they've sawn off great strips of his skin and torn out his liver and his kidneys. I left a big mess of intestines sticking out all smelly and slimy and all the rest of him is rotting away so that when he walks around little mouldery bits of them fall off like big dandruff. He wishes and wishes he hadn't left his body to medical science because it hurts so badly so every night he rises up off the dissecting table and he trails messily back to this house where he liked living and he's maybe upstairs right this minute. Yes he is and he's thinking I like that star she was always nice to me I'm going to go and see how she is. And he's coming, Star. He's slivering along, dripping maggots, getting nearer and nearer. 
Something creaked, and we both screamed. Then we sat up, ears straining, wondering if it was Marigold back at last. But then we heard the whoosh of the boiler in the kitchen. It was just the hot water system switching itself on. Oh well, said Star. We could just go and have a bath in a minute. Let's have one more look around the flat. She could have crept in while we were cuddled up. We could have gone to sleep without realising it, I said. We both padded all over the flat, though we knew there wasn't a chance Marigold was there. So when we went and had a bath together, because the water wasn't hot enough for two baths, it was like being little kids again. Star washed my hair for me, and then I did hers. I'd always longed to look like Star, but I especially envied her beautiful, long, fair hair. Mine was mouse, and it was so fine it straggled at once it grew down to my shoulders. I suppose Star looked like her father, and I looked like mine. Neither of us looked like Marigold, though we both had a hint of her green eyes. Witch's eyes, Marigold always said. Star's eyes were bluey green, mine more grey green. Marigold's eyes were emerald, the deepest glittery green, the green of summer meadows and seaweed and secret pools. Sometimes Marigold's eyes glittered so wildly, it was as if they were spinning in her head like Catherine wheels, giving off sparks. What if Marigold? I started. Stop what ifing, said Star. Hey, I thought you fancied yourself as a hairdresser. I've still got heaps of soap in my hair. She tipped jugfuls of water over her head and then started toweling herself dry. I watched her. Quit staring, Star snapped. I couldn't help staring at her. It was so strange seeing her with a chest. I peered down at my own, but it was still as flat as a boy's. Two pimples, said Star, sneering at me. Turn around, let me do your back. We got dressed in our school clothes. Well, our version of school clothes. I wore one of Marigold's dresses she cut small for me. Back, black with silver moon and star embroidery. I called it my witch dress and thought it beautiful. It still smelt very faintly of Marigold's perfume. I sniffed it now. Is it sweaty? said Star. No. I don't know why you keep wearing that old thing anyway. You just get teased. I get teased anyway, I said. Star used to wear much weirder outfits when she was at my school, but nobody ever dared tease Star. She changed when she started at the high school. She wore the proper uniform. She wanted to. She got money off Marigold the minute she got in, got it out of the post office and went to the school's special uniform sale, got herself a hideous grey skirt and a blazer and white blouses and even a tie. She customised them when she went into year eight, shortening the skirt until it was way up above her knees and she put pin badges all over the blazer lapels. It was the way all the wilder girls in her class altered their uniform. Star didn't seem to want to do it her way anymore. She checked herself in the mirror and then fiddled with my dress. Sweaty or not, it needs a wash. No, it'll spoil it. It's spoilt already, and the hem's coming down at the back. Here, I'll find a pin. She tucked the wavy hem neatly into place and then stood up. Right, she said. She glanced at the kitchen table, the bowls and spoons set out, free bears style. I'm not hungry, I said. Me neither, said Star. Tell you what, Marigold's got the purse, but I've got that pound I found down the park. We'll buy chocolate on the way to school, right? Do we have to go to school? Yes, but it'll be worse if we just stay here waiting. We'll both go to school like normal. Only you won't tell anyone that she's gone missing, will you? Has she really gone missing? I don't know. But if you start blabbing about it or even go around all sad and snivelly so that some nosy teacher starts giving you the third degree, then I'm telling you, doll, they'll get the social workers in and we'll both end up in care. No, maybe not even together. Stop it. So keep your mouth shut and act like you haven't got a care in the world. Don't look like that. Smile. I tried. Star sighed and put her arm around me. She'll probably be back right after we've left the school. We'd better leave her a note. What? Star glared at me. In case she wonders if we're okay. Oh yes, like she wondered if we were okay last night, said Star. She can't help the way she is. Yes, she can, said Star, and she marched us both out of the flat. I made out I needed to go to the toilet when we were down on the main landing, so Star gave me the key. I charged back up the stairs and in at our door, and then I tore it out a page from my project book and scribbled on it. Then I ran back downstairs again. Mrs Luff came to the door in her dressing gown, her hair pinned into little silver snails all over her head. I've told you girls enough times. Stop charging up and down the stairs like that. My whole flat shakes and the stairs won't stand it. There's the dry rot. I've spoken to the trust a dozen times, but they don't do anything. You'll put your foot right through it if you don't watch out. I stood still, staring down at the old wooden stairs. I imagined them crumbling beneath me, my foot falling through, all of me tumbling down into the dark, rotting world below. I edged downwards on tiptoe, holding my breath. Come on, doll, we'll, we'll be late, said Star. When I got nearer, she whispered, she's the one that's talking rot. I sniggered. 
Mrs. Luft sniffed, sniffed disapprovingly, folding her arms over her droopy old lady chest. How's that mother of yours then? she asked. I stood still again. She's fine, said Star. No more funny turns, said Mrs. Luft unpleasantly. I don't know what you mean, said Star, and grabbed me. Come on, doll. Doll, Star, Mrs. Luft muttered, muttered, muttered mockingly, shaking her head. Old cow, Star said as she went out of the house. Yes, old cow, I said, imagining Mrs. Luft with horns springing out of her curlers and udders bunching up the front of her brushed nylon nighty. Star went into the paper shop and bought us both a Mars bar. I sunk my teeth into the firm stickiness, taking big bites so that my mouth was overwhelmed with the taste of chocolate. I just love Mars bars, I said ind indistinctly. Me too, said Star. Good idea, eh? Right, you come and wait for me outside school this afternoon, OK? OK, I said. I did my best to smile, as if I didn't have a care in the world. You can have the rest of my Mars if you like, said Star, thrusting the last little piece of hers in my hand. She ran off to join up with a whole gaggle of high school girls getting off the bus. I trudged on towards Holybrook Primary. Nearly everyone got taken by their mothers, even the kids in year six. Marigold hardly ever took me to school. Mostly she stayed in bed in the morning. I didn't mind. It was easier that way. I didn't like to think about the times when she had come to the school, when she'd gone right in and talked to the teachers. I ran to stop myself thinking and touched the school gate seven times for luck. It didn't work. We had to divide up into partners for letter writing, and no one wanted to be my partner. I ended up with Ronnie Churley. He said, rats, and sat at the furthest edge of the seat, not looking at me. So, I wrote a long letter to myself instead of doing the exercise properly, and Miss Hill said I should learn to listen to instructions and gave me naught out of ten. Ronnie Churley was furious with me because he got naught too. He said it wasn't fair, it was all my fault. He whispered he and his mates were going to get me at dinner time. I said, like I'm supposed to be scared? in a very fierce, bold, star voice. Only I was scared of Ronnie Churley, and he had a lot of mates. I hid at dinner time, lurking in the cloakrooms. I stood on a bench and looked out of the window at the playground. Ronnie Churley and his gang were picking on Owley Morris instead of me. I felt a bit mean about poor Owley, but I couldn't help it. I wandered around the cloakroom, looking at everybody's boring jackets and coats, and working out how Marigold could make them look pretty. A velvet trim here, a purple satin lining, little studs in a Celtic design, an embroidered green dragon breathing crimson fire. When Mrs Dunstan, the deputy head, walked past with some little kid who'd fallen over in the playground, I dropped the sleeve of someone's coat like it was red hot. Mrs Dunstan asked what I was doing, and didn't I know children weren't allowed in the cloakrooms at playtimes? I got pink in the face because I hate being told off. Mrs Dunstan frowned at me. Why were you touching that coat, hmm? My pink became peony. You weren't going through the pockets, were you? I stood rooted to the spot, staring at her. I'm not a thief, I said. I didn't say you were, said Mrs Dunstan. Well, run along now and don't let me catch you here again. I nearly ran right out of the school and all the way home, but it would be even worse there by myself. I had to wait to meet Star that afternoon. I remembered my promise. I put my head up high, stretched my lips and sauntered off as if I didn't have a care in the world. I could feel Mrs Dunstan's gaze scorching my back. I got to the playground 30 seconds before the bell. Thirty seconds can seem a lifetime when Ronnie Churley and his mates are punching you in the stomach and giving you Chinese burns on each wrist. I couldn't think straight during the afternoon. I just kept thinking about the flat, whether Marigold was in it. I inked a careful picture of her Marigold tattoo, with its full head and pointed leaves and swirly stem, chewing hard on the tip of my pen. I drew another Marigold, and another. I bent my head and whispered her name over and over again. I started to convince myself it was the only way to make her safe. Who's she talking to? Talking to herself. She's a nutter, just like her mum. I turned around to Kaylee Richards and Yvonne Mason and spat at them. The spit landed on Kaylee's maths book. My mouth was inky, so it made a little blue pool on the, on the page. She screamed. Yuck! She spat on my book. It nearly landed on me. I could catch a terrible disease off of her. She's disgusting. Miss Hill told Kaylee to calm down and stop being so melodramatic. She mopped up the spit herself with blotting paper and then stood over me. What is the matter with you today? I clenched my fists and put my chin up and smiled as if I didn't have a care in the world. I was sent to stand outside the classroom for insolence. Then, when the bell went, Miss Hill gave me this long lecture, going on and on, and I had to get right over to the high school to meet Star. If I wasn't there, when she got out, she'd maybe think I'd gone home already. Then she'd go off without me. You're not even listening to me, said Miss Hill. She looked at me closely. You look so worried. What is it? I'm worried about being late home, Miss Hill. She paused. 
her tongue feeling around her mouth like a goldfish swimming in a bowl. Is everything all right at home? She asked. Oh yes, fine. Your mother? She's fine, I said, my voice loud and cheery, practically bursting into song. Miss Hill didn't seem convinced, but she made a little shooing gesture of her hand to show I was dismissed. I made a run for it before she could change her mind. I heard the high school bell go just as I got there. Star was one of the first, without all her friends. She looked at me. You've told someone. No, I haven't, I swear. Star nodded. Okay, sorry. I knew you wouldn't really tell. We walked home, barely talking. When we turned into our road, I grabbed Star's hand. She didn't pull away. Her own palm was as sweaty as mine. And that is where we will leave part one of The Illustrated Mum by Jacqueline Wilson. I'll be back soon with the next part of this fantastic story and lots more stories and videos coming your way very soon. If you'd like to subscribe or hit a like, that's always appreciated. Thanks for listening, guys. Take care. Bye bye.